Hey, good evening, Martin. I appreciate you uh, taking this time this afternoon or yeah, afternoon for you, evening for me uh, due to the time difference. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am a full-time police officer. I am a part-time realtor and real estate investor. Uh, I currently have 11 properties totaling 16 doors. Um, that's a makeup of condo, townhouses, and uh, regular houses, as well as apartment buildings. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, it for me. Yeah. Okay. And then, so what made you get transition from being a cop to now you uh do you want to do you wanted to do real estate uh to, to be completely honest with you I, I got bit by the real estate bug probably i want to say 2017 it's, it was probably even earlier than that it, it really started with my first property I, I bought my first house or bought my first condo in 2011 and from there, I was just, you know, just trying to avoid renting was the key thing because I realized that renting was just throwing away money. You didn't see any uh, return on investment by renting. And, uh, and so I went and bought my first condo 2011 when the housing market was down. I stayed there for almost five years. And then I was kind of forced to be what's called an accidental landlord in which uh, I couldn't couldn't sell it for the price that I thought it was worth. And or I couldn't sell it as quickly as, uh, as I wanted to for the price that I thought it was worth. And so I was like, all right, you know what? This thing is just not making uh, any money just sitting there vacant. So let me go and put a renter in there. And I put a renter in there. Uh, I happened to scream right on that particular property. And a couple of years later, after collecting rent from that tenant, I literally just put all that money into a separate bank account and noticed that, hey, that, money, that property over there is making some pretty good money because I literally didn't spend a dime of it. The only time money came out of that account is literally when I had to go over there and make repairs. And in two years, I probably had two repairs. And so uh, I was like, hey, I think I'm onto something here. I was like, if I had 10 more of these, I probably wouldn't even have to work. And so that's when the wheels really started to turn for me and start to realize that, uh, you know, real estate could really be something in terms of on the investing side. And so that's when I really started the journey and started to try to educate myself and try to figure out, all right, you know, what can I really do with this real estate investing thing? Uh, was your condo a new build? I mean, that's a blessing. You didn't have, you only had two repairs in two years. Uh, it wasn't a new build. It was, it, uh, the building itself was probably built in the early 1900s, but it was remodeled or redone in 2003. And I bought it in 2011. So, you know, it had new everything, you know, new plumbing, new electrical, granite countertops, stainless steel, uh, hardwood floors, cherry wood cabinets, uh, master bath. So it was a two bedroom, two bath. and uh, whoever, you know, the, the developer was who came in there and converted it all to condos in 2003. I'm thankful for whoever that was because, yeah, uh, it's definitely just been low maintenance on that condo. And so uh, basically with your portfolio, you told me that you buy and hold. Uh, with you buying and holding, uh, what made you go to buying and holding and not anything else in real estate, you know, real estate investing? Uh, I, I originally actually tried to do a flipper originally starting on and when uh, when I really started to look at long term, what it is that I was trying to accomplish, I started to notice that that flipping didn't have the same benefits as buy and hold. It's literally I start to notice that the government essentially rewards you in, when it comes to the tax code for being buy and hold investors versus flipping. And so I was like, well, this is really what I'm trying to do anyway. And, you know, I kind of got sidetracked a little bit by the flicking uh, w with the flipping aspect of it, because you hear about how some of these investors, they make monster returns on uh, some of these flipping projects they do, 80, 90,000. But I'm like, at the end of the day, you still gotta pay you know, almost up to 40% sometimes to the government for, for being a flipper. And you know, so I'm yeah. like, I'm like, why give that to the government when I can literally just add that to my network if I was to keep it and turn it into a rental? And yeah. then at the same time, have it bring in monthly cash flow, you know? so. That's that's what was important to me. Was I, I'm like, hey, I really got into this because I said if I had 10 more condos, I wouldn't have to work. So let me focus on getting 10 more type condos so I don't have to work. And so what you're referring to is you, you were finding your financial freedom number. Yes. Or you identified your financial freedom number and you're like, OK, I need 10 condos to be financially free to where I don't have to rely on my primary job. And I think that's what a lot of people should do. Uh, that 
are looking for an end goal, like, you know, because we could shoot, say, hey, I want to have a real estate empire and, and own 500 units, which is fine. But I think the, the original reason why a lot of us start to do this is because we want some type of freedom. And so I think the cool thing is, is to find your find uh, your freedom number and then shoot for that. And then obviously expand further on if you want to, because it's a beautiful thing, man. Just if you could just wake up and when you want to and <laughs> and uh, be able to have the freedom to, you know, money's coming and you're sleeping and you don't have to worry about going to shifts that you probably didn't want to. It, it becomes something of a passion and something that you love to do uh, when it comes to your condos. Uh, do you have con uh, COA? uh coa fees kind of association fees so i, I just uh, technically only have one condo and that condo does have uh what we call them up here and uh in the uh, midwest we call them a uh, hoa homeowner association fees mm -hmm. and yes I, I do have a homeowner association fee for that particular property um but my townhouses uh none of them have uh hoas or coas but yeah which is which is awesome so when it yeah. when it comes to uh, you analyze it. So you said condo, your condo was kind of like you said, uh, you were forced into it being a landlord. But when it came to buying your townhomes, uh, what drove you to townhomes and not single family homes? Uh, to be complete honest with you, I, I had knew some people who stayed in townhouses. I've stayed in a townhouse before myself. And for me specifically, when I was looking at the time, uh, it was a low barrier to entry for the, uh, I, I wanted to kind of hedge my risk by investing a lower amount of capital. And so I was noticing that townhouses essentially was a uh, low hanging fruit, uh, essentially, and great areas that I was trying to invest in. And so that's, that's essentially where it came from. Okay. And how are you, how are you able to fund your deals? How uh, do you so finance? I'm, so that condo specifically, the condo started off uh, was literally the gate, uh, you know, just the gateway for me. It started off with that one. I was able to pay that particular property off. And after I paid that particular property off, I wound up getting a home equity line of credit or also called a HELOC on that property. And so I was able to take that cash that I had invested in it and and just uh, roll it into the next deal. So I literally just, it was like cash, essentially. A home equity line of credit is just like cash. So I would literally go to the bank and I would say, give me $40,000. And I would take that and buy a, con, uh, buy a townhouse cash. and fix it up and do the bird method. The bird method stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, do the bird method, uh, get it all fixed up, rent it out, get refinance, pull the vast majority of that capital back out and do it all over again. And then how are you, how are you analyzing these deals? What are you, what are you taking into consideration when you're calculating these birds? Cause you're the first person I've talked to where you're burring uh, townhomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to townhouses, I, I really look at them just like any other type of asset in terms of a house or apartment building or, or what have you. So more so I look at it just like I, I would look at a house. So specifically uh, when I do a townhouse, because it does not have an HOA fee, again, it's just like a house for me. So I need to take into account, you know, the, cap the capital expenditures. I have to take into account any type of maintenance that may come up. But for the most part, when I go in and I rehab the property, I'm trying to go in and take care of everything up front. I don't, I don't do a gut rehab on it, but I make sure I take care of all the cosmetic stuff. I make sure that the plumbing and uh, electrical are in good working condition. And then that usually keeps my capital expenditures and my maintenance low. So specifically in terms of percentage, I like to do 8% for my vacancy and uh, anywhere from five to 10% for my capital expenditures and my maintenance. Okay, great. Uh, so I like the fact that you talked about percentages. So some people have like baseline, like for some of my units, putting a hundred dollars aside flat is, is enough will suffice for my repairs and my CapEx mm -hmm. and my vacancy. Uh, but then you mentioned you do percentage of what your rental income is, right? So 8% of your rental income goes towards vacancy is what you were explaining earlier. Say it one more time. I'm sorry. I was distracted. <laughs> um, so no, no, you're fine. Uh, so you were saying that 8% of your rental income goes towards vacancy. Like you do it based off percentage. Right. And I, and I, yeah. And I was just explaining earlier, like I do it based off of, uh, depending on my unit, where my unit is at and what his requirements are, I do it off of a flat rate sometimes. And that's right. how it works for me. Uh, yeah, so for me, a hundred or 150 flat works for me. Uh, yeah. the vacancy, the vacancy rate is so low out here. Um, it's, it's 3% vacancy in one of the areas of my triplex 
And so within when I put put up a unit within um, a week, I have 150 applicants. Right. So I, I usually don't have to have so much vacancy put aside. Uh, but COVID did switch things up a bit. But in normal cases, it's, it's, it is definitely uh, depending on the vacancy rate in your area. Uh, it will depend on how much you need to put aside. So thank thank you for bringing that part of it. You do percentages uh, based off your rental income. Yeah, and then another thing I'll just add to that. For example, I got one property that's a house that's renting right now for twenty two hundred. For that one, technically, I I don't need to do percentages for that one. You know, I, I don't need to do ten percent. You know, I I, I mean I, I could do ten percent or I could do eight percent, uh, but you know something like that you know, because it's renting for so high, I can do a flat rate like you do for just say, hey, $100 in this particular category. And you're fine. Exactly. What's your uh, vetting process? Do you have a property management or you property uh, manage your own? Yep, I manage all my own properties. Okay, so what are, what are the benefits? Why, why did you decide to do that? Uh, me personally, I, I mean, I just wanted to start off. I, I felt like I really wanted to know all the ins and outs before I turned it over to a property manager. I want to know what what exactly if I when I do decide to turn it over to property management, what exactly I'm going to be paying them to do. So I want to know how frequently the tenant's going to be calling, what type of maintenance request they're going to be calling about. Is it something that I can fix or is it something that I need to hire out? But initially uh, I was like, you know what, I, I don't need to pay a property manager to do this because essentially I got a tenant that calls maybe once a month. Uh, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. And so I'm like, I feel like I have enough free time where I can handle this phone call and delegate accordingly. That makes sense. And uh, it's a blessing to have that, to be able to have that ability to do so, especially with as many as you said, 11 units total. Yes. So yeah, that is, that is great because some people would be saying, Hey, I'm stretched in with 11. Uh, I think <laughs> I just had, I think I had a, um, I had one guy that we just interviewed a few weeks ago where he said, 11 was stretching it for him. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's great. Yeah. And I think the key to my property management is, like I said, I'm literally just taking phone calls and delegating accordingly. So I, I literally just had a, a tenant call about a car accident in the front yard. You know, somebody drives into the front yard. I'm like, all right, so specifically, what is it that I need to do to fix that situation? I'm not going to go over there and repair the fence myself. And so since I'm not going to go repair the fence myself, who do I need to have go fix the fence? All right. First and foremost, I need to get a police report. I told the tenant, all right, get a police report. She got a police report. I'm going to see if they got insurance and then we're going to go from there, you know? So, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, other simple things like maintenance, for example, I, I had another tenant call about um, HVAC issues. So I was like, she was like, Hey, you know, uh, the furnace is acting up. Okay. I don't know anything about furnaces. So <laughs> let me make one phone call to my HVAC guy. Have him go over there, check it out, build me at the end of the day. All right. Yeah. And, and literally, and that's how, how, how we play the game back and forth. So for the most part, 99% of all of the repairs that need to be made, I'm just delegating to somebody else. So literally, I'm just a secretary for my own for my own property management. And I'm literally just delegating it to whoever I need to delegate it to. And then once I get so many more units, I literally, I'll probably bring on a full-time staffer so somebody to take those phone calls for me. But I don't need to take those phone calls anymore. Have you ever had to deal with any legal issues? Have you had to uh, go to court? I had to do an eviction one time, but outside of that, I, I've been blessed to not have to do deal with any other type of legal issues. But I, yeah, other than the eviction, that's been it. Did you find that process uh, like you rather have had a property manager deal with it, or did you find it easy? But maybe because you're already a cop. How did no. that work? So for me personally, I, I really was uh, happy with the fact that uh, I was embracing the challenge. I, I found myself tr looking at things as like, hey, this is an opportunity for me to learn. Um, I, ideally, this is not an ideal situation that I wanted to be in. I wish I would have screened the tenant a little better and not have to worry about having to evict them. Um, but nevertheless, here we are. I can either turn this over to an attorney or I can just do this myself. So the very first eviction, um, for the most part, I, I did for myself. And then I, uh, I literally filed all the paperwork uh, as much as I could file it to the, to the point where the tenant was just dodging me. So then I had to bring on a process server. So somebody to officially serve her. And then I brought in an attorney to just bring it the rest of the way. It was that when you brought in the attorney, was that like a flat rate? Or you had to pay that attorney um, hourly. Uh, so he wanted a flat rate fee. Uh, so I was like, I'll go to the first one and let you know. <laughs> and so I was able to go to the first one and she already had her an attorney. 
And so the attorney was like, well, listen, she just wants an extra month to, uh, to stay uh and then she'll be out or something like that something something uh something simple and i was like all right that's fine but she's got to pay yada 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 and so she paid uh she wound up leaving like two months later or something like that and i was fortunate to get the unit back but hindsight being a perfect 2020 considering that illinois is a a very tenant friendly uh state uh, i would have definitely handled it differently but i was looking forward to the experience of figuring out how evictions work in illinois and is they as bad as everyone makes them seem and yeah, about uh, they're 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 as bad as your mind makes them, um, but you are losing money. Like literally, I lost five thousand dollars because of that eviction. Uh, in what way? Because she was not paying rent, uh, or be, or turnover uh, turnover. Uh, if you include the turnover portion of it, I probably closer to ten because <laughs> uh, not only did I lose the rent for her not paying for X amount of months, but then on top of that, I had to go in there and turn it over. And when you go in there, you turn it over. You always find little things, and you always make. Me personally, I really want to make sure it looks really nice. So I went in there and I was like, oh, this, this kitchen floor is a hot mess. So I'm just going to replace all the kitchen floors. And I'm like, oh, this particular property doesn't have an AC unit in the back. So I'm going to uh, put an AC unit in there. So all those little things that uh, eventually wind up adding up. <laughs> uh, was there, uh, t- did you not try to file for garnishment? I have not filed yet. I literally been looking at the paperwork and been thinking to myself, I'm like, should I go after her for these $5,000? I've literally been thinking about it. Um, but in Illinois, like I said, or just with the civil process in general, you know, I can take it to court. I could try to get the money. Uh, and the, of course the courts don't force you to pay, you know, they just say, Hey, um, you have to pay this person, but they don't facilitate you getting your money and you can put, you know, you can try to file for garnishment, but it, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. If they don't have any money in the first place, you're garnishing zero, you know, so and then they turn around and file for bankruptcy and just wipes all of it out in the first place. So literally what my attorney was saying was he was like, don't take good money that you have in your pocket to go after a tenant who has no money. Go after bad money. Sometimes you just got to talk it up and talk it up as a loss. So with that, with that being said, I'm like, uh, I might have to just chalk this up as a loss. So I've been going back and forth about it. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I'm like, if I'm already down at court for, or if I'm already down at uh, downtown Chicago to file some other paperwork, I might just file on her and just make it one lump sum action. So I, like I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I'm still thinking about it. The opportunity I was afforded, and this is maybe a different type of payment method that I was uh, approached on literally today, because I have a, a, I have two garnishments that total up to about 10, 10 grand. And what he said was, this lawyer was saying, I pay $200 retainer, which is the $200 pretty much files the garnishment for them to find the, the, you know, the old tenant, you know, find them where they're at. And based off what they owe, whatever we recover, they get a third of it. So if we don't recover anything, then nobody gets anything, right? I don't have to repay them for their time. If we do recover money, then they get a third. Now I was like, man, you know, if uh if i get to my 10 grand back you're gonna get like 2500 back or you know more than that actually like 3500 but right. i paid you 200 dollars to take a bet i'll take the bet for my 6500 i'll get back Absolutely. you know so i had to shop around a bit this is my third lawyer uh shopping around for a deal that i think kind of makes sense uh even though i'm not really happy about the one third i'll pay the 200 dollars to take to roll the dice Right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will have to see if there's an attorney who does something similar to that up here in Illinois and uh, maybe just pay them to go after her. They must be really confident in their ability. So <laughs> yeah. that's the only thing I can think of as why they would take that bet and they charge that high because they they're pretty sure that they'll get the money back. Uh, so we talked about the property management side. The uh, construction side, what has been your process in doing your burrs? Are you doing it all by yourself? Are you contracting out? Uh, So for the most part, I subcontract. I work with my father. Uh, He's kind of my GC. So he's my hands on deck on the project. Um, So he oversees the day-to-day operation. He picks up supplies. Um, You know, he hires, he fires uh, for the most part. So uh, in terms of when we actually go through a property, um, let's say we bought a property, we bought the property, there are certain things after I've done my first first uh, burr that I was like, all right, I'm going to do all my burrs this way because I really just want to copy and paste. I don't want to complicate it. Yes. I want to make it to 
uh, complex. I literally just want to copy and paste. I got a good product here. I got people beating down the door for it. Let's just let's just copy and paste this formula until until we have to change something up. Until nobody wants this particular design or layout anymore, and then I and I change the materials accordingly. But for the most part, people want stainless steel appliances, hardwood floors. Um, uh, you know, they want it freshly painted. So we do all those things. So specifically, when we walk in. I'm looking at the floors. Are they hardwood or do I got to put down laminate? Uh, kitchens, I want ceramic tiles uh, in the kitchen and the bathrooms. Like I said, I re repaint the entire house. Um, I'm usually looking at, in terms of the mechanicals, I'm looking at the roof to see if the roof has life on it. If the roof has at least 10 years life on it, we'll keep it. Anything usually less than that, we're usually just putting a new one on there. Um, Furnace and AC, we're usually putting a new one in there if it's less than 50% of its life in there. Sometimes we will keep it, but for the most part, we try not to inconvenience the tenant. And uh, we try to replace that up front so they don't have to worry about having that replaced anytime soon. Um, what else we got? Um, and I really think that's it for uh, when it comes to electrical and plumbing. Like I said, if it's working, if it's in good condition, we leave it alone. If it's an issue, then we'll replace it accordingly. Uh, for example, the one of my m most latest projects, it had aluminum wire in there. And that was the first time that I've ever dealt with aluminum wiring. For those of you who don't know, aluminum wiring is um, significantly more likely to catch fire than copper wiring um, because of its poor connections and the way that it was made. It, it was popular in the 70s when copper, when it was having a, a, copper sh a copper shortage. So they decided to go up with this aluminum wiring but it's extremely more flammable if you don't have the proper connections, either on the outlets or the switches. So we went through and we replaced all the electrical throughout the entire house. So now the whole entire house is copper wire. Um, yeah, so uh, that was about six grand. Um, like I said, plumbing, we've been great. We've been blessed. We've been fortunate that it's been no plumbing issues. Um, every once in a while, we have to fix some leaks. Um, but for the most part, we keep the plumbing as is. But I'm getting to the point now where I'm like, uh, I, I'm probably going to start switching to copper plumbing. Oh, why copper, not uh, PVC piping? Uh, well, specifically, uh, well, for example, if it's the hotter cold water drains, or excuse me, the hotter cold water lines, uh, in the Midwest up here is galvanized plumbing. Uh, so if you don't know anything about galvanized plumbing, specifically in the inside of the galvanized plumbing, over time, it just starts to rust and, and build up corrosion on the inside. And so if you ever seen your water come out brown after you haven't used it for like a day or so, that's essentially galvanized uh, plumbing. Uh, so people typically don't want that in their water. You know, that's just built up God knows what uh, bacteria and, and uh, debris or whatever that's in there. And so ideally people want copper plumbing because it doesn't build up all that. So your water always comes out clear. Um, in terms of the actual drains, uh, things of that nature, you know, that's also like a, a cast iron plumbing. And for that, you know, if you can use PVC for that, we, we definitely recommend it. We haven't had any issues with the stacks or the drains, but whenever possible, let's say just even underneath the kitchen sinks or the bathroom sinks, we switch to PVC for those. Okay. Those okay. Really and I'm assuming the copper is, it, it is good for the climate that you're in. It doesn't freeze up. Oh no, it does, and, and that's the oh, it does. other, and and that's the other reason why I've been reluctant to do so because I'm like, hey, the great thing about galvanized is, literally, it doesn't, it's it's not as um, it's not as thin as copper plumbing because literally, if your pipe frees up with copper plumbing, you're gonna have a pipe burst, but yep. your pipes can freeze with galvanized, and you not have any leaks, which is which is really interesting. So uh, that's like literally. At one of my latest projects, <laughs> just coincidentally enough, we had a, uh, a my father turned off the furnace and forgot to turn it back on because we were checking, making sure that there were no gas leaks. And so when he turned off the furnace, he forgot to turn it back on. We left for two days. The pipes had froze up. This was in the middle of January. And and so it was, what, 12 degrees the, those two days. And so the, he came back. He said the pipes are froze up. I was like, all right, turn on the furnace and it's eventually will defrost. So the furnace got back up, got the uh, the temperature inside the house back up above 60, no leaks. But definitely with copper, you know, that would have instantly burst. Oh, man. Yeah. So that's good to know. Uh, I haven't looked at, you know, looking at outside of 
different real estate markets, but it's good to know what challenges each climate uh, deals with or each real estate market deals with. Uh, so yeah. that's definitely good to know. Uh, how do you plan on uh, continuing to buy more deals? Are you con just continuing the birth strategy? Or are you looking at looking at commercial real estate? Uh, so literally, I got an appointment to talk to somebody on Friday about some commercials just to see what opportunity present themselves in commercial. Um, but specifically in terms of units i'm looking to scale my portfolio in terms of going into multi-units just going more units more doors uh, i think that would allow me to just get to financial freedom uh much more quicker uh so that's that's where i'm leaning towards it's just more units more doors and then seeing what other opportunities present themselves in turn in the commercial realm as well as i'm also just exploring business opportunities because where we are right now and in this day and age people don't realize and someone said it to me and I was like, huh, and I'm like, that's very much true. We're actually in a, a small bit, a uh, small business crash because a lot of small businesses due to COVID is, is just going out of business. So if you can find a profitable small business, uh, one that's maybe one that's from a baby born who just deciding, you know, he's too old for this or she's too old for this and they just want to close up their doors, but they're literally not even trying to sell their business. They're just saying, hey, I'm done. I'm hanging it up. If you could buy that for pennies on the dollars, that's great. Interesting. Like maybe some type of like nail salon or a barbershop or something or. Yeah. And a bakery. Or just, just some sort of products or service or customer, uh, customer service type business. Um, literally just seeing, you know, just what the future holds in, in that regard. Just finding one of those businesses to take advantage of. How would you uh, plan your commercial uh, deal? Is it, is it going to be something different compared to your burr, your burr strategies you've been using? Uh, it depends. It depends. It, it, like I said, it, it could be something that's already where you have a, a, a tenant in place. Like I would love to acquire a property where, you know, it's like maybe five, five units uh, and it's already got, you know, businesses in place, whether it's a nail salon, whether it's uh, a brokerage of some sort, you know, something where it already has it in place, or maybe even something more sophisticated, like a Walgreens, like a Culver's, you know, something that has that type of com uh, combination of businesses in it. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally just looking at to see what opportunities come my way and just and learn and learn and grow because I, I don't know a whole lot about commercial because I've never done commercial. So I'm looking forward to this conversation that I'm going to have with this gentleman just to see uh, what he has to offer and what direction it, it, it leans me towards. Do you see yourself retiring um, as a police officer or you, you have a stopping point to where or a goal set to, hey, this is where I plan to be in a certain X amount of years and then that's when I'm going to cut it? No, I, I, quite frankly, without getting into too, too much politics, I feel like the political climate that we're in right now, um, I, I don't see myself retiring as a police officer. Um, so not not the traditional retirement. I, 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 like I said, I've been bit by the real estate bug. I've been bit by just the fire movement, which is financial independence, retire early. Yep. And, and, and so I'm like, I'm not going to make it to age 55. It's, it's not going to happen. I'm 35 right now. And so... I'm like, if I acquire, you know, just a couple more properties, I can sit at home and play Fortnite all day. So it's just not, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I'm like, I'm not going to do another 20 years in, in the political climate that we're in. It's just not going to happen. So as of right now, I'm literally looking to jump ship as soon as I can, but it has to be the right opportunity. Uh, likewise, um, I've been in the military for about almost 12 years. Um, was able to make, uh, become a chief. Uh, so my, my career has worked out pretty well for me. But like you, I am looking for that opportunity. So I'm giving myself a, a three-year time span while I'm on shore duty to mm -hmm. uh, knock out everything I can to provide myself the opportunity to kind of step away from it. Because uh, the freedom, it, it, once you get that real estate bug, yeah, you start seeing the possibilities and the freedom that you can have is, uh, is very crazy on the, you know what you could accomplish. I forgot to ask you earlier, what is the minimum cash flow you are looking for when it comes to your birds? And what is your highest cash flow that you get from one of your birds? Uh, so the minimum cash flow I'm typically looking for when I first started was $200. Uh, I, I literally followed the Brandon Turner philosophy. He, he said, you know, if it makes $100 a door after, you know, after all expenses are paid and money is put away, 
he was happy with that. I was like, well, I'm in Chicago. I'm like, I think we can do a little bit better than that being in a big city. And he was in, you know, a small rural town. So I was like, all right, let, let me see if I can go shoot for 200. So the first deal was me. I was just shooting for 200 in terms of where I'm at, in terms of cash flow. I have the, the lowest property is cash flowing $211. I literally just had to update my spreadsheet numbers. The lowest property is $211. The best property is about uh, I want to say seven hundred and thirty-eight dollars, um, and well, yeah, seven hundred thirty-eight dollars specifically for my personal portfolio. But if you were to count the six unit, the six unit is probably doing like sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars, um, you know, because it's just more doors, you know. So, and you bought that one on your own, or you had partners? Uh, that particular one, I had partners, so you you got to divide that by three. Okay. And so how did you, can you explain how you structured that deal together with partners? That's a big thing you hear on bigger pockets, right? Uh, and other real estate forums where they say about having to put other people's money together. Mm-hmm. Not too often you hear about operational agreements and how to structure the deal to where everybody wins. Can you break down that that process for you, please? Yeah. So first and foremost, it was just an alignment of interest. So we had to check and make sure that everybody was on the same page and what we were trying to do and what we we're trying to accomplish and make sure that we're always on the same page in that regard. And once we all had several conversations, because it wasn't just one conversation, it was several conversations just to make sure that we were on the same path. It was literally um, reverse engineering where we wanted to be as a company, uh, as a group, as a collective and deciding how we were going to get there. And so we really just started by getting our feet wet, uh, buying one property. We bought one small townhouse. And then from there, we bought the six unit. And, and now we're looking to, you know, just continue to grow uh, from, 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 that, uh, from this point on. And so, uh, it, it, like I said, it specifically, it was just a lot of communication, just a lot of communication. What my role was going to be, what their roles were, were going to be, um, and uh, just figuring it out along the way, to be completely honest with, with you as well. Uh, for example, just talking about uh, when the, when our dividends are going to be paid, um, who's going to be responsible for managing the tenants, who's going to be responsible for administrative uh, duties, who's going to be responding for, uh, responsible for the accounting, um, who's going to be responsible for searching for the next deal. So these were all just conversations that we had, and, and we just w- worked our way through them. Just literally, we, we literally meet once a week just to have these conversations. Oh, wow. Okay. And I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, how often uh, are y'all communicating and talking uh, and then the dividends. So how does that work with the dividends? Do y'all have a, y'all, you said you had a bit, y'all, y'all had a business. And mm-hmm. so does that, the money go towards to the business account and then who divvies up the, the, the you know, at three ways. Who- yeah. So, so specifically it would be on the accountant. So literally one of the business partners, he's the accountant on, on it. So he literally is responsible for every week giving us a financial update on where we are, what expenses did we have this particular week, what money came in, what money went out, showing us that literally every week. And then on, on, as of right now, we agreed to do a quarterly uh, distribution. So every quarter, we we just agreed that, all right, we're going to uh, distribute cash flow from, from the business back into our own pockets. That's, that's an awesome setup. It sounds like it's very organized and everybody's on the same page. It doesn't sound emotional. It sounds very... No structured and business like yeah yes for the most part but i can put it to you that way but i can tell you sometimes in those meetings it get heated <laughs> and that's just uh, that's just a fact of life you know sometimes you got to have rough conversations in order to just make sure that you're all on the same page and not everybody's going to be happy but as long as we're all uh, trying to achieve the same collective goal then that's ultimately what matters you know we don't always agree on what's the best uh way to handle something but we come together, a uh, unanimous decision is usually made and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, because, um, and, and I'm glad you're telling me this, you know, you're saying this to the listeners because I, for, for me, you know, me and my fiance, you know, when we do deals, we like, we like to have full control, right? Yeah. And so I, I rack my brain on different ways to fund a deal, whether it's like an FHA two or three K loan, or it is a burr, uh, mm-hmm. taking a HELOC out to make, you know, every, every opportunity or resource that I have, we have, we'll use that, you know, we'll blow that up first uh, before we'll um, reach out. Uh, And also too, man, my personal thing that I got to get over is networking. I'm not really the best at like, Hey, you want to do a deal together and, you know, put our money together. Uh, (laughs) It's that's not my forte. And I know for me, I, 
<laughs> and I have a particular I have a particular standard that I've realized while in this business, whether you're a real estate agent, a property manager, a contractor, you know what I realize is is really trash in this uh, realm. It's customer service, customer yes. service, and following up. Yes. Uh, it is not the best, and it's just that simple. Because I work in a customer service field in the military, and right. so does my fiance. So like that's a big deal to us. And mm-hmm. I don't have to be the best persuasive person when it comes to real estate aid being a real estate agent but if i follow up if i have great customer service i I have a good chance of closing that deal if i'm a property manager i may not have the best resources but if i have good customer service and i follow up and i keep being persistent i think my people are going to keep dealing with me and so there's a um professional lack i've noticed in this field that mm-hmm. it's hard for me to for us to align ourselves with other individuals that have that same um they care about that particular a, uh, attribute the same so it's been it's, it's been challenging so i got two little challenges myself getting to really talk to people and get to know them and then building that relationship and then at the same time identifying do we meet because a lot of times they may not and then i, I just talked to you for months and then we didn't work out anyways. I guess it's like relationships, right? Like, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like- and I agree 1000% because literally when I when I was building my companies, uh, my personal, uh, you know, me and my wife's personal companies, uh, uh, the, in, you know, in, in the book uh, Traction, they talk about just building the EOS system. So what's your, you know, what's your long term goals? And reverse engineering from from there specifically, you know, and it, it literally talks about, you know, what are you going to be your intangibles? What's going to separate you from another company? And so one of the key things that we put up there, number one was customer service, because we noticed that specifically uh, tenants or former tenants that we had or, or that people were serving, we noticed that they always complained about their landlord saying that their landlords were some lords or just their customer service was bad. He never returned phone calls. He only took their money and he never fixed anything. So we wanted to say, hey, hey, we as a company, we as landlords, we're going to cater to our tenants. We're going to make sure that they're happy. We're going to do everything that's within our power to make sure they're satisfied because customer service matters. If we can keep them happy, we can at least, you know, we may not be able to address every single issue right then and there when they wanted to, but if we communicate when we intend to get it done, and if we follow through and we do what we say we're going to do, then that typically keeps tenants longer than someone who just never calls back and only takes their money and never repairs anything and, and just seems like a slumlord, you know, so th- that was definitely our philosophy. No, and, and it is ours as well. I definitely believe in handling things swiftly, but I, I am big on properly assessing the issue. Uh, I think when you deal when you deal in haste, sometimes you make a poor decision. You probably spend more money than you need to. Um, or it could be something simple as changing a light bulb. It's like, hey, just change the light bulb, you know, Mr. Tenant, and uh, you'll be fine. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And, and and again, I think that that comes uh, like simple things like that. Sometimes it's just about uh, setting the priorities with the, or setting the expectations with the tenants to say, hey, here's what my roles and responsibility is as the landlord slash property manager. Here's what your roles and responsibility is as a tenant, you know? So you calling me to change a life up on an eight foot ceiling. It's, it's, it, you're going to have to change that one yourself, you know, but you calling me because you have a water leak, you know, that's understandable. I'm going to come over there. We're going to get that fixed. Uh, so you said you manage your own properties. Do you use a property management um, online service like Buildrum or uh, Avail? Yes, I use, I use Cozy. Cozy? Cozy? Yep, Cozy.co. Yep. So, okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's great because, like I said, that particular platform, uh, tenants can pay uh, a multitude of ways, but they can also make service requests and we can add credits or we can add bills. So, if, like, for example, one tenant damaged the blinds and she said, hey, I'm just going to pay for this. Can you just add it, tack it onto my bill? So, we're able to go onto the platform and say, all right, it was $25 for the blinds, you know, and they were able to pay it with their next month's rent. Or they can also make service requests. They can say, hey, you know what? I'm noticing that there's a leak here. Could you come over here and fix it? And then we can just track that maintenance item through that through the website, which is great. Um, we can see, um, again, tenants can go on there. They can pay early. They can see what their balance is. I have one tenant who specifically just forgets uh, how much money she paid. She's like, hey, I... Uh, how much money did I pay last month? I was like, I don't know. Let me go on Cozy and see. So I go into Cozy, type it in and see. I'm like, oh, okay. You double paid the water bill. So you actually have a credit for 
X amount of dollars. So this month you only have to pay this much. Oh, she's like, okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You know, so like little things like that, which I think the website is great for. Uh, it gives them, like I said, multiple payment options. Uh, so not only can they pay with their checking account, which is free, but if they want to use their debit card or their credit card, it gives them that options as well too, versus, you know, showing up to that door on the first of the month saying, where's my money, <laughs> you know, yes. around taking cash all the time, you know, so. So yeah, uh, great program. So I use a veil that they charge $5 per unit that I add. Um, mm -hmm. So when I had my five units, I would, you know, $25 a month. Uh, the only thing I had against Avail was, so you can do the option to do automatic payments and it wouldn't charge you if you did like automatic bank drafts. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of my tenants didn't like that, right? They wanted the power to be able to pay, make their payments on their own. But right. then they also didn't like paying the debit or credit card because it charged them a processing fee, which right. was a percentage of what the rent was. So it was like, you know, if your rent was $700, it was charging them like $20 service fee or something. So they were like, I don't want to do that either. Right. Uh, so I'll be continuing to shop around because yeah, like, we're looking. Go ahead. I think I, I definitely think you should look into a cozy. They actually combined with apartments.com. So if you were to try to go to cozy now and try to create a, uh, an account, they're actually going to forge you over to apartments.com, but it's essentially one of the same platform. Um, they just combined their resources. And eventually I think they're going to phase out cozy.co altogether and put everybody on apartments.com. Um, but essentially, like I said, you get all those benefits. Uh, the only thing that I would say is a downfall of cozy depends on how quickly you want your money, because sometimes it can take up to five business days to get your money. So if the tenant pays on the first, you know, you may have to wait to the sixth or the seventh before it actually hits your account. Um, OK, so that's not, not that's not too bad. No, not no, too no. bad, because um, I usually get disbursements between the 12th and the 15th of the month from my property manager. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm used to kind of getting it in the middle of the month. But I, you know, the more time passes outside of handling things legally, um, yeah, the more time that passes, it's looking more and more like I, I would prefer to go back to property managing the properties now, only because now too I have more time on my hands. Um, so I, I was deployed a lot over the last mm -hmm. four years, so I was always on sea duty, going out overseas. But with me being on shore duty for the next three years, it's looking more and more feasible that I can manage it. We'll see. We got we're expecting. A baby girl on the way and then we oh, would like nice. one more so thank you so we'll see how much time i do have on my hands to handle it nice. uh but a lot of times man i was talking to nate barger from uh, the burr invest group investment group yeah uh, i had, i had interviewed him he was episode 35 mm -hmm. and he talked about he's like man he's like you throw away so much money having a property manager and having you know um not having your own contracting team uh, because there's a lot of things that you, you, you cut, not cut corners, but you will cut off a lot of the fat when you are directly uh, in control of those two identities or entities uh, to ensure the stability and, um, and the longevity of your, your uh, real estate business. Yeah, I agree 1000%. I follow him in the Burr Invest group and as well as I follow him on TikTok. But uh, yeah, he, he's a, he's a good guy. And uh He's, he's definitely right. That's the number one reason why I have not gone with a general contractor because I'm like, it's just a middleman who's charging me to bring all these resources together. Uh, I would rather just, you know, sub it out accordingly and not have to get charged enough fee and then literally let my father manage the property managers and keep it all in the family. <laughs> you know, there's somebody I can, uh, that I know, like, and trust in my father. <laughs> so, you know, I, oh, I, I did have I did have a question. So, with the your with cozy, how do you build your leases? They have templates, but do you add some um, some paragraphs in there that are tailored to the requirements that you have for your properties? Yeah, so they offer leases. Me personally, Illinois again, very tenant friendly state. They don't give you as the the property owner or the property manager any type of leeway if you mess up the fines are ridiculous. Two times the monthly rent plus court costs, two times a monthly or two and a half times cost of monthly rent plus lawyer fees and court costs. So, you know, you really got to make sure that your lease has everything. And so by me being a licensed realtor, I really just go on to uh, go and download the realtor's lease, which is uh, through the Chicago Association of Realtors. And it's a literally a, like a 25 page lease that has everything that's literally has been tried and tested in court and it's held up and then on okay top good of, on top of that 
I, I add in a nine page document, just literally laying out all the rules. So everything that you could probably think of uh, in terms of just condition of the way you should keep your house, dogs or, pet, or any type of pets, window treatments, windows, business hours, uh, quarterly inspections, annual inspections, you know, just a lot of little things that, you know, you think that would be common sense, but sometimes common sense is not common. And, yeah. and just put it all officially in writing in an additional nine page rules list. So, yeah, you definitely sound like you got yourself covered. Um, I haven't, I've only mentioned this maybe a couple of times, but one big thing I learned when it came to lease building was early termination fee. Mm -hmm. uh, my first property manager with my first property, I had a family of two, three at the time, wife and uh, husband with a little, uh, little baby girl. And they had one on the way and the baby was due in let's say September, October, and they wanted to move out in November, but the lease wasn't up until March. So about another six months left or five months left. So the lease said that the early termination fee will be negotiated between the landlord and the tenant. Very vague. Uh, so they moved out uh, because they, you know, they had another baby and they want to get a bigger place. And it really left up to it left us up to just negotiate. I think it was only like two months worth of rent versus the five that they really owed us. And I, oh, wow. I after that, I really um, I talked to my property manager. I'm like, I want an addendum on all our units. And I looked at the rest of the leases and all of them said the same thing. And I'm sitting there frustrated with my property manager. I'm like, yo, you've been doing this for years. Like, how has this never come up before as an issue? How has nobody ever discussed this to you? This is my first year being a, a landlord. And I know, <laughs> yo, you know, early release, you know, early termination fee, you know, at least two months for our state, two months worth of rent. Uh, so no, three months, because I was fussing about the fact it was two or one and a half or something, something small. But it was one of those things where, I, yeah, do I keep paying these lawyers or do I just take the money and bounce? Right. Uh, to, to, you know, take my losses. So uh, that was definitely a frustration for me. So I definitely got very meticulous when it came to leases. You know, it's funny because, you know, a lot of times we get a lot of papers thrown in our face, whether it's like us buying a car or even sometimes we're buying a house. I'm not reading all 200 pages, no. uh, but with that lease, but that lease I, I have been reading uh, paragraph for paragraph. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, and it's funny because that's usually what, with my leases, I literally go line by line through every lease uh, with the tenant to say, hey, this is going to take about 30 minutes to an hour, but I need to read to you word for word with this lease. <laughs> and, and I'm like, if you renew, if you decide to renew, we don't, we can, we can just kind of, you know, skim over some of this stuff. But for the first time, I got to read to you, read this to you word for word. Uh, so, so that you're aware. If anything changes, I'll let you know if any changes or you can just read them yourself, but you got a copy, but here it is, you know, if you want to read it thoroughly uh, and, and wait wait to sign it, then here you are. But uh, it's funny that you mentioned early termination fee because I actually, I don't know off the top of my head, once you're in the contract, um, we usually kind of lock you in, but um, I don't know if there's uh, some sort of early termination clause, like literally for the, for us, from what I can remember, once you're locked in, you're locked in. So you can either, you usually have to see if you could subleases and, and our leases say no subleasing. So it usually you have to come to an agreement with the landlord, you know, hey, this is what the situation is and this is how much I'm gonna pay for it, essentially exiting out of lease early. So what I, so I thought about that, right? And mm -hmm. if you leave, before you're supposed to, then I can charge you um, the six months that's left on the lease or until right. I, you know, rent it out. Um, but one thing that I realized is I don't want nobody there that doesn't want to be there. Right. Uh, because what I realize is, is that a lot of people, if they don't want to be there, they care less and less because they know, right. I will say probably, probably seven or eight out of 10 times, man, a lot, the landlord is not chasing them down after they've left. They chuck up their losses, kind of like with your five grand, right? Right. And then that person is they're good, you know, unless you submit them to the, you know, um, credit bureau, uh, you know, put or put a lien on them. But nine times right. out of 10, they don't own anything to put a lien on. Right. Uh, so. Right. It just shows funny how that they, judgment on that credit. Exactly. It shows that. Yeah. You know, somebody money, you know, it, it reflects negatively on their credit score. But 
you know, considering somebody who already had a bad credit score when they moved in, you making it go lower, do they really care? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, it went from 400 to 320 now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I forgot, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, so <laughs> with the early termination fee, uh, it's kind of their scapegoat. Hey, if you want to get out, you can, but you got to pay me for turnover because you probably, I probably need to repaint. I need to market, stuff like that. Uh, right. But I do want you gone if you don't want to be there, because I've noticed it's more of a headache when somebody is there unwillingly. Um, and it's just it's it, those last six months of nightmare is like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not going to force anybody to stay who doesn't want to be there. I know that for the most part, you know, we got a good product, you know, the turnover. Yeah, we're going to spend a couple of dollars to turn it over, probably repaint and to clean it up and to fix any type of maintenance issues that you didn't tell us about. But I'd rather have somebody who wants to be there than somebody who doesn't want to be there, probably going to intentionally break stuff or something to that extent, you know. I'm glad you said maintenance issues. Uh, how often do you do inspections on your properties? So we tell the tenants we do quarterly inspections. Depending on how good the tenant is, we don't do quarterly inspections. We'll do every six months. We do every year. Anytime we get in there and we have to fix a maintenance issue, that's an opportunity for inspection, an unofficial inspection. So if they call us to say, hey, can you fix a, you know, a linky sink or the door's falling off the hinges, you know, while we're in there, you know, all right, let me just go ahead and do the inspection since I'm here. Let me check the smoke detectors, uh, CO detectors, you know, all that good stuff. All right, everything looks good. No deferred maintenance. Oh, I noticed that this over here is actually broke. I'm gonna come over there or we're gonna send somebody back over here to fix that. You know, if this, if this ever happens again, you know, this is an opportunity to tell them, hey, when stuff like this breaks, just let us know immediately. We actually had one tenant, she hadn't been calling for months because she just she just takes care of the house with pride. You know, she, she, she really has pride of ownership, you know, even though she doesn't own, she's a tenant. And then she called us up one day out of the blue and just said, hey, I got, you know, one, two, three, four, five maintenance requests. He's like, wait, 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 <laughs> you got all this stuff going wrong? You should have called us when the first thing went wrong. So, you know, just a little, uh, you know, training in that regards, you know, training your tenants. And yeah, training your like, tenants. Hey, when something goes wrong, let us know immediately. But then we got over there and fixed everything that same week, you know, so. And then again, that gives us the opportunity to, hey, since we're already in here fixing some stuff, let's go around and check through the property. And again, we usually tell our primary guy who goes in and fix everything, also known as my father, you know, to look around <laughs> the property, make sure that, you know, you're not seeing anything. He owns property as well, too. So he knows what to look for. He's been doing it for 20 plus years. So he let us know, hey, such and such has uh, got problems with this or such and such has uh, a boyfriend living in there who's not on the lease or, you know, so he'll know all these things and we'll discuss all these things and we'll decide, you know, if it's something that we want to strongly enforce or, you know, if it, they've been a great tenant and they take great care of the property that, you know, if it's something that we want to let slide at one time. Yeah. You know, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but like it was, <laughs> I have one tenant that they're, they're good, you know, they're caught up and I really, I, the only issue I've had from them in the last year was yesterday, which they just got, uh, they had electrical, uh, their living room, had electrical issue with the with the light, with the main light in the living room. Other than that, the only thing they complained a little bit about the water here being installed in there, but they needed it because I needed all three units to have water because it was one boiler was servicing two different apartments. So you know, if somebody uses the water in one apartment, it would uh, obviously the other apartment would have cold water. So I had to right. put it somewhere. But uh, you know, I inspected one of the units, well, their unit in particular, and I saw a bud of weed there, and I was just like, ah. They're breaking yeah. the lease, but <laughs> yeah. they're paying, but they're paying rent all the time. So I was just like, all right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny that you say that. Cause I literally, um, one tenant, you know, like it was apparent that they were lying on the lease. They was like, Oh, we don't smoke. We don't smoke. And I'm like, y'all do smoke. Like, like I, I could tell, like, listen, I'm a cop. <laughs> I already know the telltale signs. <laughs> smoke so i just went into it and tell him like listen no smoking in the house no smoking in the house no smoking in the house if you are going to smoke you can smoke outside like well can we at least go outside in the backyard and smoke i was like yes as long as you don't smoke in the house because you know it's a pain in the butt sometimes to get that smoke smell out of the house that's fine but at the same time also know you know depending on what you're smoking and i'm going to assume you're smoking cigarettes and not something else <laughs> you know you, you you literally you know down the street from a police department you know so just keep that in mind you know so you, you sometimes can cause unwanted 
trouble among yourself if you're if you're doing the wrong activities outside. And I, I, I tried to really stress that as well too is make sure that they understand that you know you have expectations in terms of your behavior, how you act, not only in the house but outside the house. I don't want you to bring unnecessary ruckus to the neighborhood. Yes, it lowers the rents. Yes, yes. <laughs> and you and you want everybody you want everybody to feel safe. You know, yeah. unjokingly, you want everybody to feel like they're in a safe environment. Uh, right. That's and one I, thing that uh, was actually a marketing tip I got from one of the uh, our interviewers we had lewis porter he told me uh that he markets towards single mothers and the elderly and the mm -hmm. biggest thing that he focuses on is uh safety safe for the elderly safe for single mothers single parents uh if you create a safe environment uh obviously anybody will go into a safe environment uh but you it does allow you to um pinpoint a certain demographic that are more than likely may be looking for a place to be, uh, be that is affordable mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 1000%. And so uh, with everything that you're doing, man, which by the way, um, big ups to you and your father uh, being a dynamic mm -hmm. duo. Uh, that's kind of how me and my father are as well. Uh, nice. He's definitely helped me a, a lot out. He's not a general contract, general contractor, but he's a handyman. And so yeah. me and him definitely Same have uh, wor worked on a lot of things together. Um, and I pay him too, because I, I believe in compensating even family. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so I'm real. Yeah, yeah. So I, I definitely could relate to that, man. Uh, I, I like it. I plan to do the same with my son. I've actually had my son come with me. He's eight and I have him, you know, sanding down countertops because I want him to kind of learn uh, this stuff early. Uh, he had a particular, I'm going to tell you, uh, tell you this real quick. He talked about having a boss, you know, because he, because a boss would tell him what to do. And I told him like, what makes you think, you know, you need a boss. And, you know, he was like, because uh, how am I supposed to know what to do for my job? I was like, what, tell, what makes you think you need that? I said, you see daddy out doing real estate, getting properties, and you see nobody's telling him to do that. And you see that that's income, more income for the house. So why would you think you need to go out and just work for somebody else when you see, like, in your life, the ability to be able to just do your own thing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's crazy at the age of eight, Right. How we are exposed that early. We are exposed to the idea, get a job, work for somebody, do my 20, 30 years. And then that is success in life. Right. Right. And it's, it's just so crazy at that age. We're conditioned based on just the cartoons. Maybe we watch or the TV shows that we watch. That's what is that's the American dream. Yeah, that's the, that's the way to be. And so I, I, I intend to expunge that idea of my son. Uh, completely so by the time he's you know 16 17 18 he, he will be buying you know his first property with his own cash trying to show him how to flip uh his money into more uh and i definitely encourage other people to be doing that that's so that's why i really look at i think it's really cool about you and your father doing your thing together yeah and it's, I think it's that's how we're supposed to be doing that. it yeah and it's funny that you mentioned that too because you know i bring my son along he's 10 years old i bring him along to the job site and i have him help me out and and do some things as well and i'm like hey i want you to understand like there's more than one way to skin a cat school is going to teach you you know the w-2 way you know they're probably going to push the vast majority of w-2 way because unfortunately you're surrounded by w-2 employees you know yes. so that's going to be the mindset. They're going to tell you about all the benefits. They're going to tell you how to go about doing it this particular way. But if I were to take you around a group of entrepreneurs, you're going to be seeing the entrepreneur way. You're going to see the self-employed way. You're going to see the way that they structure and organize their time and the way that they do things and the benefits of doing it that particular way too. So I want you to be exposed to both, uh, both sides of the coin and not just one side of the coin. So you don't feel like it's only one way to skin the cat out here, you know, that you have to go and work for somebody for 20 or 30 years. If you want to, you know, stay at home and you want to play video games all day, if you build your lifestyle to where you can do that, uh, then, then yes, that could be your life, you know, but you know, if you decide that, you know, you want to take a different route, you know, if you want to go work a nine to five, I'll support that too. But I want you to know that there's more than one way to, to skin a cat in this regard. It's more than one way to earn a living. Yes, because he talked about um, he wanted to be in the military like me. And I told him, you know, you don't have to do things how daddy did it. I did it so that I could, you know, afford a decent life for you. 
mm-hmm. then I used the military benefits to, you know, like the VA loan to buy property and stuff like that. But right. uh, the, the idea is to be able to provide our kids the opportunity so they don't have to make the sacrifices we did. Um, right. I do believe in creating adversity so that you're not just this weak kid without any fortitude because everything was kind of given to you. Right? right. So I do believe in uh, creating a bit of adversity and challenges so that he is um, he's ready. He's seasoned enough to uh, deal with the, the, the controversies that he will face um, as an as an adult, you know, with anything, you know. Yeah. I, this- I, I, yeah, I agree one thousand percent, because what I figured out along the way is I'm like a lot of stuff is really about mindset, you know, just training your mind to be able to take on adversities, you know, whether the glass is half empty or the half full, how it's all dependent on how you look at it, you know, whether the situation is bad or good or indifferent, it's all about the way that you see it, you know, the way that you process the way you, you feel, you tell yourself you're going to feel about it. You know, nothing is inherently good or bad, but your mind makes it so. And so really just understanding, you know, you have to be the master of your own mind. You, you literally have to decide how it is that you're going to look at something and, and how you're going to treat, you know, there's literally, you know, people who live in third world countries, you know, who literally have, have to go to sleep the bombs every day, but their mindset is they're just happy to be alive and they're happy to have what they have and they don't have the greatest amenities or anything like that. And I'm like, we, you know, I'm like, you're living with first world problems. So understand you could be in a worse situation and it's all about the way that your mind sees it, you know? So I really want you to understand that, that hey, mindset is everything. Mindset is everything. You, you really have to think, look at things from a, a psychological point of view and, and understand that, you know, the, the world can be whatever you want it to be. But you have yes, to be able to turn your mind. And so uh, with all this being said, man, uh, what do you consider your rich state of mind? What is your big why as to why you're doing what you're doing? Uh, for me, it's all about freedom. Just freedom. It, just freedom, time, freedom, money, freedom. You know, I want to be able to do what I want to do when I want to do it, how I want to do it. You know, like I said, I, uh, me growing up, I, I didn't have the easiest life to say the least, you know, but, you know, I had my family. I can, that's one thing that I can always say is that I had my family. And so when I go back and I look at that now and I, I think to myself how blessed I was, I'm like, you know what, you know, we may not have had a whole lot of money growing up. You know, we, we, we might have been the poorest on the block, you know, but we always had each other. We, we always stuck together, which is great. And I'm like, that's that's the type of values that I want to instill to my children, you know, just freedom. I want to be there from, for my son's soccer game, for, you know, if he decides to play basketball, you know, I want to be there for them major important events. I want to be able to spend time with my family, you know, all these sacrifices that I'm making today, you know, so I can have tomorrow and, and have the present, you know, to, to be with them and, and give them the things that I've never had. So it, for me, it's just all it surrounds around freedom. Awesome, man. You have uh, you have a great story. I like how you are very structured and organized and uh, you are you are a proof that it is possible. It may not be easy, but it is possible to uh, not have to outsource with contracting uh, and not have to um, completely outsource, obviously, with property management. You, you know, you're handling that at your level. You just outsource. Obviously, when you come to a plumber or electrician, you, you obviously are not a certified electrician. And right. uh, it's always your best interest to, to outsource that part. So um, thank yeah, you for sharing sharing that. Um, everything, especially going into detail with your uh, your how you structured your deal with the six unit. Um, that's a, that's a hump I got to get over my per- myself personally. Yeah. And then um, you um, burning townhomes, which is that like I said, that's the first time um, I'm actually interviewing somebody that's burning townhomes. You don't really hear that as like that's the that's the popping thing to do. People always talk about single family homes or maybe yeah. even duplexes. So. That's different, uh, especially because they're all side side by side each other, you know? Yeah. So um, definitely appreciate your time, Martin. Uh, Thank you. This has been a pleasure, man.